Welcome everybody to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension and Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, the Wisconsin Public Television folks, now known as PBS Wisconsin, uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Julia Nordyke. She's with the UW Sea Grant Institute here at UW Madison, and she's stationed at UW Green Bay. She was born in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and then went to high school at Summit High School near Breckenridge, Colorado in Summit County. I bet she knows how to ski. <laughs> She went to Colorado State University in Fort Collins and got an undergraduate degree in zoology. And then she came to UW-Madison to get her master's degree in conservation biology and sustainable development. She was telling me that her master's research was done on modeling a wetland in the south of France, otherwise known as the Camargue. There are wetlands in the south of Wisconsin. You chose well. Way to go. Uh, 2013, uh, she joined UWC Grant and has been stationed at UW Green Bay at the Biodiversity Center there. Um, this is a very interesting collaboration between UW Madison and UW Green Bay. Tonight, she's going to talk us about, to us about something that's uh, pretty important to the history and future of Wisconsin, and that is the water quality of Green Bay, past, present, and future. Would you please join me in welcoming Julia Nordyke to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, thank you so much. That was probably the nicest introduction I've ever had in my life, so I appreciate that. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I work for the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute, and you might be wondering, uh, particularly, what does Sea Grant doing in Wisconsin? <laughs> uh, well, Sea Grant is a NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or the Weather People, a NOAA university partnership, and we are, make up a national network in our coastal states, and the Great Lakes make up part of our nation's coastline. Um, and so we, NOAA partners with the university to fund research, outreach, and um, education on sustaining our Great Lakes resources. Um, so we also have, as part of my job, I'm the water quality outreach specialist. Uh, so we used to be called Fish Grant for a long time. You can kind of think of us as your county extension agent in hip boots, basically. Uh, but I focus on water quality. My colleagues, we have different specialties. We do have a fishery specialist, social science, coastal engineering, and even climate and tourism up, up north in, in Superior. Okay, so let's get talking about the Bay of Green Bay. Just to raise the hands, is anybody from the, the Green Bay area? Okay, a few people, great. Um, well, I think the first thing to notice here is that it's actually observable from space. <laughs> so it is large. It's called, it's been coined the largest freshwater estuary in the world. I like to say a fresh, fresh estuary. Um, but it goes north to south, 119 miles long, at its widest part, 23 miles wide. It's relatively shallow, averaging 15 to 20 feet in depth, um, and then, but at its maximum, 150 feet. And it really, why we know it as it is an estuary is because the, the Fox River actually empties into it, which is pretty unique uh, in this part of um, the world in terms of it's one of the rivers that flows from south to north, entering into the southern part of the bay, of Green Bay. And, uh, and, and estuary is a mixing of different waters from the coast or from the lakes and the rivers to the coasts. And so we see a strong biological component gradient kind of going from that uh, south to north end. Um, so this is the, uh, the basin of the watershed of Green Bay. It's over 16,000 square miles. It has six major rivers, and it provides Lake Michigan with approximately 25% of its water. So there, this is a really significant part of our Great Lakes and Lake Michigan in our system, and a wonderful resource. So this is the lower, this is the Fox Wolf watershed. This is the largest watershed that drains into the Bay of Green Bay. Itself is over 66 square miles 
And you can see that it stands, starts way up in the northern part of Wisconsin. And the Wolf River drains towards Lake Winnebago, the Upper Fox to Lake Winnebago, and then eventually uh, down the Lower Fox River. Um, so this is, you can see a lot of Wisconsin. Um, it, a third of the water in Wisconsin is going into the Bay of Green Bay. So where I'd like to start really about the history of in the past with the Bay of Green Bay and that region in general is some of who lived there originally, our First Nations. Um, so it was the Winnebago Ho-Chunk. They had been there for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and it wasn't, and they spoke, it was, it was a Sioux-speaking tribe. Uh, they extended down to Lake Winnebago all the way to the Illinois, the Rock River in Illinois um, and the Wisconsin River area. Uh, they traditionally, they, they hunted, they, they grew corn and tobacco, uh, they fished and hunted. Fishing was incredibly important um, to uh, First Nation tribes. Uh, this is depicting, uh, they were cooperative in their fishing, and they would go, this is a, a depiction of a Menominee, something you might see with a Menominee tribe, uh, and they would go out at night, uh, they'd fish cooperatively with spears, and the lanterns would attract the fish to the surface, and then they would spear them. This area was extremely rich in natural resources, and so this is an example also of the Wisconsin copper culture, and it's some of the earliest um, evidence we have of metal being used in North America, and so this is also coming from that region of the, of the state. So really rich resource. It wasn't until the mid, um, to the 1600s that the Europeans finally landed there. So this is really unique part of Wisconsin's history. Um, the Bay of Green Bay, specifically the Red Banks area, was the first place Europeans made contact uh, with, the air, with Wisconsin in general. And it was Cham um, Samuel de Champlain, which was the, the governor of New France in Quebec, and he sent out Jean Nicolet uh, down to find, he had heard of the people of the sea. And so of course they were searching for um, the, the west and looking for um, easiest routes to China for exchange of goods. And so they set out in uh, 19, or 1634 um, and went through the St. Lawrence River and, and eventually made their way to the banks of Green Bay. <laughs> so thinking he was going to uh, be meeting people, um, in, he was going to be meeting people with Asia, he doned. This is a, a depiction of him landing on the Red Banks in his ostentatious uh, silken robes and firing pistols coming abroad. Um, uh, and it kind of tells a tale about that time and how, and how the, what potentially the future domination of, of uh, European culture came uh, upon into the First Nation area. Um, at that point, he was invited to uh, dinner, and they started making relations with the native peoples at that time. Uh, and it said that he was very, very impressed by the six score of beavers that were served, but it wasn't to do with their to eat them. It had to do with their pelts. Uh, and so began uh, really one of the major attractants for Europeans to this area was the fur trade. Um, and this, uh, they. They really, they harvested mink, otter, and beaver pellets, and it became just a really um, um, key location uh, for the fur trade. The French were eventually uh, kicked, kind of kicked out by the British for a while based because they were dealing with the French and Indian War, and, and that was all over fur trading posts uh, throughout North America. So fur trading peaked in 18... 34 approximately when they basically had deforested a lot of the area and out um, and over harvested uh, and this is really when land sales started uh, in this area in 1936 or sorry 1836 um, so it was at this time then we started seeing more European settlements and about 1848 is when Wisconsin became a state uh, and land sales really took off. They, and then there was a lot of farming and agriculture. So this area was really rich in water and the Fox Valley really provided a great place to do agriculture and forestry and logging. And the Fox River being a natural conduit uh, to actually move the, move the logs in place here. So it began an incredible expansion. We saw, a, we have a really rich Belgian American history there of agriculture. Uh, they started by with grains, uh, but eventually moving towards dairies. 
Uh, logging um, has, is really well known in the Fox Valley. Uh, today, it remains one of the uh, highest uh, densely uh, industrialized site for paper making and logging in the world. Uh, and this was a major resource uh, uh, and industrial center. Also, we had a vast amount of natural resources in terms of the fish and, and waterfowl hunting was incredible here, uh, a really big resource here. I put this picture up. You can see that they were just collecting them by maybe the hundreds at this point. Uh, and really, this kind of took off as, as some of the natural resources to this region. This is um, a picture depicting actual co some commercial fishing. Um, around this time, at the turn of the... Uh, the 20th century, or I'm sorry, yes, the turn of the 20th century. And then in the early 1900s, um, what we started seeing is the development of Bay Beach. So Bay Beach still is there today. Um, what it started off was, was with, they wanted to do a private cottages and then they opened this beach, and, uh, but they were having a really hard time attracting people. The roads weren't very good and it was in the middle of a wetland, so there was a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> but eventually, uh, someone else bought, bought it and developed it more into a resort type or a, a area and then he, they would boat people on a 540 foot dock that extended into the water. Uh, they built the, one of the first uh, shoot the shoots, like an uh, early version of the log ride where they'd haul up 12 people and slide them down into the bay. They were also known for uh, renting out bathing suits <laughs> at, at five cents uh, five, or 10 cents a day. And it said that on a good day, they would uh, gross up to $450. And they were never quite free of sand, though, and always a little wet. <laughs> um, unfortunately, at this time, we saw a massive in industrialization happening and the growth of our um, uh, the society there. Uh, and it really, this area really started going through some, some growing pains. The river was itself um, considered more of a place to put waste uh, rather than a resource at that time. And it started to show. In the 1920s, a civic organization started to really uh, uh, raise concerns about the stench of the river. Um, and then fish kills were happening. And then eventually, ice harvesting had to stop. Um, it was in the 1920s that the first statewide pollution of our major rivers was done in Wisconsin. And they, found, they really discovered that we really had a really serious issue with low oxygen levels uh, in the Fox River itself. <clears throat> but the major question was what was causing the pollution? Was it our canneries? Was it our foundries? Was it the creameries? Was it the pulp and paper making uh, industry? It wasn't until about the 1930s uh, and 40s that uh, they tried to take measures. This 1931, the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewerage District was formed. So it wasn't until then that they were actually treating a municipal waste coming off of what, um, what the Green Bay area was producing. It was all just going directly into the bay. I think pretty amazingly, it wasn't until 1949 that the state of Wisconsin required the municipalities in the Fox Valley to actually have wastewater treatment plants. Imagine that. So a lot of waste went re untreated for decades and decades in this area. And it was starting to show. By the 1930s, they had to start closing Bay Beach. They tried to close it in the mid-30s, but then people stuck, kept going. Eventually, the Public Health Department in 1943 closed it permanently. People were, were uh, complaining of getting sores, and there was dysentery, and there was just things that weren't going very well there. So uh, they did permanently close the beach. And it is still closed today, but for a future story. Uh, during the 1950s, we started seeing a lot more chemicals coming into the system. And so this is just an example of the discharge uh, from a papermaking um, plant. Um, so uh, we, the pulp industry itself, they were basically industry, they had no, they didn't have to treat anything and they were allowed to discharge it if they want. Uh, so when the pulp and all these chemicals go in, they were actually, when they were trying to decompose, it was eating up all the oxygen in the river. It was cre creating sulfite liquor, uh, things that were really kind of not good for the, the river and the bay. <coughs> what we see is this is the Green Bay May Mayfly or Hexagenia. 
This is a really important food source for walleye and other fish in the bay. Um, so they're about two, in, the wingspan's about two inches long. And so this is a picture of Lake Erie, but it's, you can see a mayfly hatch on, on the radar. So they would uh, multiply by thousands. And at a certain time of year, they would be thousands covering the Green Bay area um, and a really important food source. They were said to, um, uh, they were said in the Green Bay area to just basically cover the streets and in the turn of the century, they would have a contest where kids would sh uh, shovel them as many as they could actually to, for $5. <laughs> the, they, have a, um, they have written language or written reports of trees just and branches just bowing down at times of them being so covered in, the, in, in, in mayflies. So mayflies have a pretty interesting life history, though. Uh, they spend most of their life buried in the sediments at the bottom of the river in the bay. For two years, they are in this nymph stage, and they only come up uh, and turn into the mayfly. Um, at, they, come to, they emerge from the water, uh, and then they're basically breeding machines, and they don't even have feeding mouth parts. And so they come up, uh, they breed on top of, and then lay the eggs on top of the water, and then basically die off in one or two days. Uh, but because they spend most of their life on, on the bottom of the bay in the sediments when there's no oxygen or there's chemicals, uh, we really started to see an impact on their populations. Um, and so some of the early surveys, and think of this, this was like millions and millions of mayflies just being sh having to sometimes be snow plowed off the, the streets of, uh, of this region. Um, in 1938, they started doing surveys, and you can see that until 1967, they just participated they rapidly dropped um, every year until basically they haven't been a around in the bay uh, since then. <coughs> we also see start to see a really big impact on our commercial fisheries. Uh, in the Bay of Green Bay, uh, uh, before 1965, uh, uh, the perch fishery, it was, they said they were approximately harvesting over a million pounds a year at that point. Uh, and this shows from 1936 to 1985, and we start to see really big declines. It was, it was the water quality and habitat destruction, but it was also um, a combination of over-harvesting at the same time, too, and a lack of food source. At this time, we saw the uh, rising concerns about um, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. Uh, these are organic uh, chemicals used in the paper making process, commonly in the Fox Valley, they started to be using, used in the recycling of carbonless copy paper for typewriters. Uh, they were used from 1954 to 1971 uh, when they became banned. Um, however, they're really persistent, and these chemicals stick to the bottom of the sediments at the bottom of the river in the bay, uh, and then they and they really have a, a lot of um, human health impacts, and then also our ecological impacts. So they started looking um, at the bird. They were, researchers were starting to see really big impacts to the bird populations there. This is a double crested cormorant with a crossbill. Um, so you can see that this was a, a genital defal, de malformation. Uh, they also were seeing foresters turns uh, having less reproductive success. Um, so as these fish eating birds were um, eating the fish below them, those fish were eating uh, the little algae and zooplankton below them, and then those were um, absorbing all the PCBs from the bottom of the sediment. Uh, these chemicals were working their way up the food chain and getting concentrated in these fish-eating birds and really having an impact on their populations. So it wasn't until 1972 when the Clean Water Act <coughs> happened, started coming around to really help. Does anybody know what senator this is? Yes. U.S. Senator Edmund Muskie um, of Maine. Uh, so during his 22 year in Congress, he was really instrumental in a lot of the environmental protection legislation that came about, but the Clean Water Act and then and the Clean Air Act uh, in 1972. Um, the Clean Water Act really had a profound effect on, on, on a water quality moving forward in our country. This was the same time the Cuyahoga River in Ohio was setting on fire. We were seeing you know, Silent Spring and the effects of DDT. Um, and we knew that we really had some serious issues. 
And uh, this was the first piece of environmental protection that really required limits on the discharge coming from industrial sources and then our wastewater treatment plants and what they could put into our rivers and lakes and our water bodies. Um, it was also at this time that the, in 1972 that the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was made. And this is a binational agreement between Canada and the United States to restore and protect the Great Lakes. Um, so this was a critical piece in the, in the U.S. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, administers this program. Um, and they started looking around the Great Lakes and seeing where to start. So they identified um, many, 43 different areas in the Great Lakes called areas of concern. These are basically polluted hot spots, places where they have concentrations of PCBs or other types of persistent uh, organic chemicals. Um, maybe there's... Uh, uh, eutrophication issues um, or, or there's a lot of habitat de degradation and so unfortunately the lower Green Bay and the Fox River were um, identified as one of those pollution hot spots um, and so this is um, what our in our area is the, uh, signifies the actual designation of our our area um, and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources is is tasked with actually coming up with, helping come up with a plan to restore it. And this, so the first plan to help take, take action and restore the lower, the health of the lower Fox River and the Bay of Green Bay started in 1987. And out of those 43 areas of concern across the Great Lakes, Green Bay was the first one to come up with a plan. People were ready for change. We have a very dedicated um, citizen, citizen and researcher group there dedicated to this. Some of their priority actions were stop industrial toxic waste from happening and going into the bay, river in the bay. Others were to actually get out what was already there. So let's, we really need to remove and dredge the sediments of these PCBs and all these other things the, from the bottom and get them out of the system. Also, we have a big nutrient problem. So we, um, we wanted to reduce phosphorus inputs that were causing major algae blooms in the Bay of Green Bay. And then also, one of my favorites, of course, as an outreach specialist, uh, they really wanted to bring more public awareness and participation in restoring the health of, of the bay itself with the Clean Bay backers. <laughs> That's Stanley Sturgeon up there. We have Marsha Frog. <laughs> Finnegan, something Finnegan. <laughs> Okay, so moving into the 21st century, what have we seen? So this is a picture looking north uh, at the very south end of the bay. This is Renard Island, uh, which was a dredge, uh, a dredge fill site. And then I think that's the Zip and Pippin. I heard somebody talking about that earlier. So that's Bay Beach as it is today. So what's going on? So we have the PCB cleanup is happening, which is really exciting. Uh, this was decades of lawsuits moving forward to say who's responsible, who's going to clean up, how much is it going to cost. And this is uh, the PCB cleanup cover, spans 39 miles, starting from Lake, Little Lake Butamore all the way to the mouth of the Fox River. Uh, the dredging process itself is actually dredging about 13 miles of the river. And it's the largest PCB cleanup in the United States um, and, uh, at this point. So it's a pretty impressive system. What you're looking at here is a hydraulic dredge. What they basically have is a pipe that goes down to the bottom and sucks up the sediment and then takes it to a processing facility like a big vacuum uh, where they actually process it uh, to take out the sediments and clean the sediments and dewater them. Um, so this is... Uh, so when it gets to the plant, so um, it is uh, separated into different types of sediment. So this is what you're seeing is sand. Uh, and so s PCBs don't really stick to sand very well. They're too coarse. And so this sand is actually clean. And so it's going to, it was beneficially reused in projects locally, like under high, uh, Highway 41. <coughs> the stuff that is contaminated, however, is dewatered. It's squeezed together all the water out of it, and then it's trucked to a landfill. Or if it's very highly contaminated, it's trucked to a toxic waste site. Um, and so today, we have approximately 150,000 truckloads of sediment that have gone. It operates when in season. It's, they're dredging 24 hours a day, uh, five to six days a week. 
um, during the season. Uh, that's like 3.3 million tons of sediment. That's about, according to some of my colleagues' calculations, uh, Lambeau Field, seven times over of sediment coming out of the Fox River, being processed, um, and then um, and getting those contaminants out. So it's a really impressive project. And what the most exciting part is, it's starting to work. So uh, they did some monitoring after they did the first uh, dredging project in Little Lake Butamorts. And what we're looking at here is the total PCB concentration uh, in, the, in the sediments. And you can see that it's quite high. And just after one year after they did the dredging, uh, we have a 94% reduction in PCBs in the sediments found. Um, and what I like the most, too, is we've had fish consumption advisories for PCBs uh, in eating fish in the Fox River for decades now. Uh, and we're starting to see declines in, in uh, our fish, uh, PCBs in our fish, particularly walleye. Uh, so in this, this graph is showing basically that line would be natural recovery. Um, and we can see that there is just after a year, 73% reduction in PCB concentration just in walleye alone. Uh, so these were, this is about 10 years ago this was done. Uh, we have, um, they've been monitoring since, and we're still seeing incredible results. For most of the fish are anywhere from, you know, 70 to over 90% reductions in PCBs. So this is a really good news story, uh, and potentially for what can come. Now, the, the Bay of Green Bay is, um, has historically been an incredibly lush emergent wetland area. Uh, really rich in, in biological uh, diversity and a, a place for fish to breed or to spawn and then to feed in a nursery area. Um, so this is a picture of some of the islands that were traditionally in the lower bay. Uh, this is the Cat Island chain. So this is a 1966 picture, so just keep this in mind. I'll go back and forth here. Uh, during the 1970s, so we had some development on the shoreline that made the wave energy higher. And then we had a really intense storm uh, in the 1976 in the spring. And it basically wiped out, wiped out these islands that were providing a lot of island habitat. <coughs> they were also acting, these islands had been acting like a barrier to behind, so this submergent wetland, an emergent wetland behind it. Uh, also from the wave action in, in, in the Bay of Green Bay. So this was a, this was a big loss. So in 2000, so over 20 years period, there was planning that we knew that uh, the bay would benefit from having these islands potentially restored. And this is the, what it looked like in 2012. <coughs> there was literally just Cat Island left, just a r really remnant of those past islands altogether. Now, uh, the, the, the port of Brown, the Brown County Port and the U.S. Army Corps, along with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Sea Grant, they worked for 20 years to make a plan that, that would actually restore these islands and beneficially uh, uh, use dredge material from the shipping channel, uh, saving a lot of money. So the shipping channel has to be dredged every year uh, to a certain depth for shipping to go through. And typically, all that dredge material has to be taken to land and then shipped to um, a landfill. Very costly endeavor. However, so instead of doing that, we're beneficially using this clean dredge sediment from the outer bay in the shipping channel, and we're going to recreate these islands. So this barrier was created. It's two and a half miles long. It goes into the bay. And you can see these cells kind of with these long fingers coming down. And so there's three islands going to be created. And over 20 to 30 years, uh, the dredge material will be placed in each of these cells. So this is the first year that dredge material was placed. And it turned out to be this beautiful sandy area. And you can see these cells will be filled up. So this is a really big win-win <coughs> for the environment and the economy, saving taxpayer dollars through beneficially reusing this dread sediment. And it's starting to provide this incredible island habitat. Um, it's going to eventually provide over uh, 240, or 242 acres of island habitat, which is critical for shoreline birds. Uh, we're already seeing um, over 30, uh, 35 shoreline birds have been seen there, and over 200 species of birds are started to, started to um, come back to the Cat Islands. Uh, really important area for these emergent wetlands, so it's going to restore, create that wave barrier again, and help that emergent wetland behind it uh, come back. Um, 
And so we have these uh, northern pintails, so waterfowls, again, a huge attractant to the Bay of Green Bay. We have these iconic, beautiful um, snowy <laughs> owls that have been visiting the Cat Island chain. Um, <laughs> and then also uh, we have an endangered species that hasn't been in the Green Bay area, the piping plover, for over 70 years. And now we've had successful breeding nest, nesting breeding pairs for several years in a row. So this is really exciting. Uh, in terms of it's actually working very quickly. And it shows, really shows you, if you give it a chance and you bring it back, uh, they will come. Uh, the current commercial fishery in the Bay of Green Bay is still extremely important to Wisconsin. Uh, the, commercial, the commercial fishery in the Bay, <coughs> we still have a small yellow perch, um, but it's pretty local at this point. More so, we are seeing uh, Lake Whitefish uh, is a really important commercial or fishery just in the Bay of Green Bay itself. And so you can see that pounds harvested, harvested um, between 2011 and 2015, the vast majority is uh, lake whitefish. And maybe a very small percentage of yellow perch, really just for local sources. Um, so, and actually, I'll, if you're wondering what a lake whitefish looks like, this is. It's also a very popular recreational ice fish, <laughs> ice fishing fish. And this is a very happy father-in-law catching a large white fish through the ice on the Bay of Green Bay. <laughs> um, um, the Bay of Green Bay is really productive, biologically speaking, and still really important to the commercial fishery of Wisconsin and Lake Michigan, and really um, makes up 30 to 50% of the commercial fishery for Lake Michigan as a whole. So that's, that says something about that system. The mayfly. So let's talk about the mayfly again for a little bit. So um, we know that they were kind of, they went, they were in a way, there wasn't a lot of oxygen, there was a lot of toxins happening uh, that maybe were preventing their populations. So there's a UW-Milwaukee researcher, Jerry Castor, who has actually uh, been trying to reintroduce and restore the mayfly population, which may be, <laughs> which is again a really important protein source for those walleye and our and just part of the ecosystem. And so he's had graduate students going to Lake Erie and the Mississippi River, collecting larvae uh, of the mayfly and bringing them back. And uh, he has planted over 400 million eggs in the Bay of Green Bay. And so the thought is, hopefully, if we can get through a population threshold, that actually they will be able to uh, reproduce on their own. So there may be some who are more excited about this than others. <laughs> so <laughs> from what I've heard, <laughs> the fishermen, yes, <laughs> the fishermen versus <laughs> the cottage owners. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is really the gorilla in the room that we're really dealing with on the Bay of the Green Bay in regards to water quality right today? Well, we have a very, very big issue with blue-green algae blooms uh, in the Bay. Uh, and um, my colleague who gave me this photo, he wanted everyone to know that the dog was moved immediately, so don't worry about it too much. Uh, but blue-green algae, so, uh, um, and what's really happening here is um, what we say too in the Bay of Green Bay is we have an algae bloom today and a dead zone tomorrow. So the algae bloom, when it dies, it sinks to the bottom of the bay and then as it decomposes, it sucks up oxygen. And we have so much of it happening that it's actually creating a dead zone in, in the Bay of Green Bay or hypoxia. So areas in the bay that have so little oxygen that it can't support life. And we see this every summer, um, and for depending on an extended part of time in the summer to fall, uh, and um, and it is definitely a big ecological concern. So, what? Why are we having this such a big issue? Well, again, let's talk about how large this drainage basin is that's just going to the bottom of the bay, uh, 6,600 square miles of land. So this is a land a cover map. And the green areas are really showing like forested areas. The yellow lighter areas are agriculture. And then those pink areas um, are, are dense urban areas. And we have a lot of land in this area that is agricultural uh, land and urban. Um, and so what we see is with some of our traditional agricultural practices in the last um, few decades uh, that we have these bare fields and, and soil erosion is occurring. And unfortunately, all this soil, when it rains or the snow melts, is ending up in the bay. 
Um, it's been said that and calculated that about approximately 24 dump trucks a day on average end up in the Bay of Green Bay. Uh, and so this is a really big problem because those farmers, they don't want their soil in the bay and neither do we. <laughs> so we want to really try to work on figuring out how we keep that soil on the ground. But it's not just the agriculture that's, that also contributes phosphorus and, and pollution to the waterways. It's, it's definitely all of us as communities, um, all of our neighbors. So we traditionally, when it rains or the snow melts again off our roofs, it's going down our storm drain and then eventually out to the street and down the storm drain. And you can see like this gutter is filled with leaves and sticks and all that things have nutrients in them themselves. And where do they end up? They eventually end up in our local water body, uh, the river stream uh, and, or, and the lake. In our region, we have a really um, high density of dairy industry in our region, and when there's a lot of cows, there's a lot of manure. Uh, and so one of the, manure is a natural fertilizer, uh, but we have almost too many cows for the amount of land that we have. So we have really a lot of agricultural land that's oversaturated in, in phosphorus and these nutrients from manure. And basically what happens is we know that when we want to grow something in our garden, uh, we put nutrients on it, phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizer. And this is basically what's happening in the Bay of Green Bay. <laughs> so we are over fertilizing it and it's causing these blue-green algae blooms. So blue-green algae is, call, is, also, is actually a cyanobacteria, so it's actually not an algae, but it's a photosynthetic bacteria. Um, and when we have too many of these nutrients, it, it creates a large bloom that can be harmful. When they decompose and die off, they actually release neuro and liver toxins. And so this can be particularly um, bad for public health and cause skin rashes or GI problems. Um, uh, it, it seems to be more of an issue for our pets because dogs just run in the water. And it's really hard to tell, even if the water is green, whether it actually has toxin, these cyanotoxins in it or not. Um, the dead zone also has, uh, and the nutrients have another effect. So this is kind of a result of the dead zone in Green Bay. I, I got this email. Uh, so they found a fish kill. Uh, so basically what had happened in this case, most of the time fish can swim away from a, a low oxygen area and aren't too affected, but these guys got stuck kind of between the shoreline and the dead zone, and they had nowhere to go. So they just, they ended up on the shoreline trying to escape the dead zone, most likely. And when we really do start to do the modeling and figure out where the, our sources of phosphorus and nutrients are coming from, uh, we can start to see some big trends. So for phosphorus, we know a lot of it is coming from cropland, uh, but we, we do have still some large sources of industrial outputs and our municipalities. So our roads, our leaves, leaf pickup, I encourage you to not put your leaves in the gutter <laughs> in Madison. <laughs> um, and so these are definitely some of the sources that we all need to work on. The total suspended solids or those sediments, the soil erosion, uh, most of it is coming from our agricultural lands. So we really need to think about how we can create healthy soils and keep that soil on the ground and not in our waterways. So what does the future hold? Well, that's hard to know. <laughs> but one thing we do know, um, this is uh, some of the information that we can talk about is comes from the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. This was a collaboration between the Department of, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and uh, UW-Madison, and really was bringing together the science of, of how we, our climate is changing, specifically the impacts to Wisconsin. And we do know that um, we're, we are getting warmer. We've seen observed trends, and we're going to continue to get warmer. So this is approximately the average um, by the mid-century that we will have projected in terms of the average temperature increase, 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the average just over the whole year. What we're really going to be seeing, uh, the warming is going to be the largest in the winter uh, in parts of our... And, and so what does that mean? That means we're going to have more precipitation in the form of rain than snow in Wisconsin. Uh, we're also getting wetter. And this is, <laughs> this is probably obvious to many people in the last couple of years. Um, but observed, we've seen parts of, the, parts of the state are getting a lot wetter. And this is the, ex the, the rainfall that's over two inches in, in per rainfall. So um, 
oh, the average precipitation over the year may not be increasing uh, or it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but we're seeing those large storm events happening. Um, so we can say that in the future we're going to have these large precipitation events. This was uh, in 2015, these huge intense storms coming through through the Great Lakes, did, uh, huge, went, swept across Lake Michigan and did a lot of damage at Sleeping Bear Dunes. Uh, but what are these big storms, the warmer winters and the big storms mean in terms of water quality for the Bay of Green Bay? Well, it means that we're going to have more runoff events, um, <coughs> or more of that soil erosion occurring. Uh, we see already that this is a large runoff event from 2011. Uh, we see that m these large runoff events, 80% of all the sediment that's going, all those uh, 24 dump trucks a day, all that sediment is, is happening really in, a sh in only a few days of the year, about 14 days of the year. So what does that mean? That's when the snow is melting or we have these really large rain events that's pushing it all onto, um, into the bay and off the landscape. So what are we, what, what's going on up in our region? We're doing some really great things working with the agricultural community. There's the Lower Fox Demonstration Network, Farms Demonstration Network. Um, and what they're doing is they're working on conservation practices to create healthier soils and reduce soil erosion. So the healthier soils will be able to infiltrate the water more and keep that soil on the land um, and not in our waterways. And then also uh, reduce the amount of um, uh, nutrients that need to be put on the land too for the farmers themselves. And some of the main conservation practices that are being focused on uh, in the Lower Fox River uh, are tilling and no tilling. So the demonstration farms, we have these volunteer farms that are putting in these practices with, some, with technical assistance. And then they're testing whether the traditional method uh, is better in terms of water quality than uh, the, the conservation practice. And so on the, on the left hand here is, a, is a, a field that is traditionally tilled. So at the end of the season, they till it up. You see this bare field. It's called a clean field. Um, and you can see how chocolate milk that is on the left hand side. Uh, whereas the no-till, where you don't till and you, you just leave the resid crop residue on the field and then in the next year you plant right into it, uh, you can see how much clearer that water is coming out when they're doing their monitoring. And so that crop residue is staying on the, the field and starting to build organic matter uh, and really and not just eroding all the soil um, into, the, into the waterways and the ditches. Another. Uh, another cover crops are another way that they're really trying to build healthier soils. So this is one of the local demonstration farms. Uh, and this is just a test plot field that has over 10 different cover crops. Uh, the man in the center there is holding a tillage radish. Um, so you can see there's a lot of diversity in the types of crops that he has here. But the tillage radish, you know, it, it is this huge giant radish that goes into the ground. It's left over winter. It decomposes and then it creates like a, um, Info, uh, irrigation basically as it decomposes and it creates these large holes. Uh, so uh, these really can actually provide more organic matter to the soil and those long root systems start to build healthier soils that can hold more water and then also catch more water and drink. Um. Another thing uh, that uh, farmers are really well known for in general is working on equipment and being innovative. And so we're starting to see this. So they're having to do some of these conservation practices. Their equipment doesn't exist. So they're having to come up with ways to adapt their equipment uh, to do these conservation practices. And what you're looking at here is a manure injector. So a, couple, a few slides ago, I showed you what a manure sprayer, which is kind of the traditional way, which is very nuisance to neighbors and the health of people spraying it and not fun for anybody. Uh, but this actually injects the manure into the ground. So it's not just sitting there on the top ready to run off in case it rains or the snow melts the next day. And, they, and these farmers are actually adapting their own equipment and coming up with new ways to, to uh, try to, to uh, mitigate the impact of nutrients. And then also we see some of the farmers actually changing uh, from cash crops to going to grazing. Uh, so there's a lot of farms that there's a lot of benefits to switching to grazing. So we know this, these grasses have long root systems. Uh, they build healthier soils. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship between the cows. Uh, they, fertile, they, go, they, they go around, they agitate the ground, they 
they do their thing and they fertilize, <laughs> they fertilize the grass. Um, and these heifers are they're shown to be healthier for the cows themselves. Um, it's also giving uh, more economic opportunities to some of the farmers who are switching these practices. Uh, one of the farmers, what we talked to about this, has really changed his um, perception and he's able to spend more time with his family um, and, and then also just be more economically stable with these kind of practices. And then really in our urban areas, we need to really start thinking about how we transform stormwater, which we think of as just get away from us and try to get it downriver, to actually more of a resource. Uh, so this is a stormwater pond, uh, but it's planted with native vegetation. It's right along the Fox River, uh, and we're really starting to see this, um, uh, you know, people starting to think about it more. And there's a trail that goes around it too. So it's not just a place to put stormwater, uh, but it's actually some, uh, becoming a community asset. Um, <coughs> thinking about infiltrating into the ground rather than running off down the gutter is uh, also green infrastructure, green stormwater infrastructure. These are engineered systems. Thinking about restoring our hydrological processes in our urban areas. So this is a permeable paver, and you can see the spaces in between the pavers and the water when it rains or the snow melts, it just goes down and infiltrates into the ground. Uh, this is an example of it just strategically placed around a small storm drain um, in our area. Uh, so it's really catching all the runoff from the, the parking lot uh, before it gets to the storm drain and hopefully reducing the amount of water going into the storm drain along with the pollution. Uh, the restoration of the Cat Island chain, again, a very successful win-win project uh, that will continue to grow. It's extremely successful, um, and it is providing a model potentially throughout the Great Lakes of how we could actually use, reuse uh, beneficial materials. And again, over 212 species of birds seen, 35 shorebirds alone. A really unique and cool project that's also happening is a wild rice restoration project that they're, they're piloting in the Bay of Green Bay. So wild rice has been historically an extremely important ecological resource for the Bay in terms of water quality benefits and providing a food source for all that waterfowl. It's also uh, culturally significant for our First Nations. Um, and what we're, and they've been seeding wild rice so, um, in, in, in the Bay for the last four or five years. Uh, so approximately every year, about 2,000 pounds of rice. Um, this year, 40 acres along the Bay uh, were planted in wild rice. And this is a, a, a pilot, and we're gonna see if we can actually get wild rice to reestablish and grow and, and be that important, important uh, ecological resource again for the region. Will we be shoveling mayflies again? I don't know the answer to that. I kind of think that could be interesting. <laughs> but and knowing that maybe we'll see if our water quality can sustain mayflies again and, and, and whether, uh, whether or not uh, this project will be, from, will be successful. The future of the Green Bay fishery. So we didn't talk too much about it, but um, this is somewhat of an unknown also. The food web in Lake Michigan and the Bay of Green Bay has changed dramatically over the last 20 years due to an um, invasive, aquatic invasive species, uh, the zebra and the quagga mussels. Uh, so they've kind of taken over and they've changed the whole food web of, of the Great Lakes and particularly Lake Michigan. Um, not quite Lake Superior, but Lake Michigan. And we are we're still unknown what the impacts are going to be to our fish species. Some things are adapting and eating them. Whitefish have been eating them, but they're skinnier <laughs> whitefish. They're not, these mussels don't provide as much nutrition. Um, and, uh, and, the, and so we don't, we're still learning a lot about how uh, our food webs in, in Lake Michigan um, have, cha have been changed due to these species. <clears throat> this is just as an update. So they were projected to end the PCB dredging uh, project uh, this year. Uh, the winter weather kind of put it off just a little bit, but it, it has wrapped up. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, 15 years of a major operation and decades of this um, legacy pollutant being taken out and what the future holds for that. That's really exciting. Uh, you know, our fish consumption advisories are going down. Um, and it's just a really exciting time to be there because this, this, um, this contaminant has really plagued this area uh, for the last 30 years. 
Does anyone recognize this plant? This is also an invasive species called Phragmites. Um, <laughs> just as a side note, they're trying to cultivate it in the south of France in the Camargue Delta. So, <laughs> but, but here it's not welcome. So it's, this is actually the shoreline of Bay Beach in 2016. And you can see uh, it's uh, not quite a beach and this can cause a big aesthetic issues uh, for uh, shorelines, uh, but also um, it's not very good for biodiversity and our wildlife either. There have been restoration efforts to actually remove Phragmites. Uh, and this is actually the same location. And you can see there's actually sand under it. So we know the beach has been closed since the 1940s, uh, and now uh, the city of Green Bay has embarked on this, uh, this plan to actually restore Bay Beach back to a beach. Um, as part of this plan, they're going to start construction on it supposedly this spring. Uh, they're going to put in this long 500-foot boardwalk wildlife viewing platform. Uh, they intend to restore beach area so people can come to the the Bay of Green Bay and actually access the water. And then the Clean Bay Backers, we're back. So um, I work with the Clean Bay Backers uh, uh, and we're a citizens advisory group and we really uh, work uh, to advise the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources from the citizens perspective on how to restore the the health of the lower Fox River in the Green Bay. And what we do is every year we take our community leaders and our elected officials on experiential uh, tour of um, the Bay of Green Bay and the lower Fox River and to really highlight the opportunities, our successes of restoration, um, some of the things you hear, and then our ongoing challenges of restoring the lower Fox River in the Bay of Green Bay. Um, and that's all I have for you tonight. Um, thank you very much. I'm more than happy to take any questions you have. Oh, boy, go ahead. I wanted to ask about the dredging. Are those platforms that move down the river? Yes, um, she, she, the question was, uh, she wanted to ask about the dredging and the platforms you saw. Yes, so those are, it's a hydraulic dredge, so basically those, those uh, platforms have GPS monitoring on them and they've mapped the whole bottom of the river. And so it's extremely precise coordinates, but what's attached to that is a giant hose that sucks up the sediment uh, based on the GPS coordinates of those, that, yes. That's different than the mechanical dredge that you also saw in a picture where it like scoops up the sediment off the bottom. <coughs> Does the hydraulic dredge do a cleaner job, basically, of getting the bottom sediments off an area? Because I, I know a scoop dredge tends to drip some of the stuff that's scooped up right back into the water. And presumably the fines are going to stay suspended until the dredge has moved on, at which point they start to settle out and I think you answered your own question, but yes. The question is, um, is the hydraulic dredge more precise in terms of dredging? For the Fox River cleanup, it's extremely precise within, I don't know, inches. Um, or I should know that, but I don't. But uh, the, um, the scoop itself, yes. You can see that a lot of the material is just coming out of it, and then it stirs up the sediment and kind of goes. It's a little bit messier of a process, absolutely. Um, so this one... For the PC, because the PCB is such a sensitive area and the loss and like the cleanup is such a sensitive issue in general, they really have to be extremely precise on what they're picking up. Um, there are high, um, for like the clean sediment in the shipping channel of the bay that's dredged, um, it depends on the bidding contract. So there could be a mechanical or it could be hydraulic depending on uh, who comes in with the lowest bid to do it. Yes, the shipping channel gets dredged every year or two so in the shipping channel. That shouldn't hold as much PCB. I would think. They, it's um, no. They have they have testing and define the the Arm, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is required to test. Um, and as you get closer to the river, that's when the PCB concentrations go higher. And then they would have to they treat it differently and have to dispose of it properly. Uh, and then to a point. Uh, the most of the shipping channel is just normal sediment. Okay. 
basically, or low enough levels um, of anything that uh, they don't have to, it's considered safe and clean. Yes? Two questions. Uh, once the mayflies basically became extinct there, what did the fish eat? Uh, what did they turn to eat? And then <coughs> secondly, have you been testing at all for PFAS in that area? Um, the first question was, um, after the mayflies disappeared, what did the fish eat? So I, 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 we kind of looked at some of the declines in the fish populations. So fish populations really, really took a nosedive um, due to habitat degradation. Uh, overfishing was a really big issue um, in the Bay. And then also, uh, if you imagine all that habitat degradation and not a food source, they probably weren't eating much <laughs> at that point. And that's why we didn't, we didn't really see uh, fish populations starting to be okay. I mean, it was really the only the species that could really tolerate these heavy uh, pollution loads and fish species that can move out of like the dead zone, for example, and go n into the northern part of the bay where the dead zone didn't exist and would be eating things that were up that, that direction. But I mean, our walleye, all of our fish populations really, really took a nosedive for a while. Uh, right now, the walleye population is uh, doing very, very well in the bay. Um, there's been, and there's been a lot of restoration efforts for northern pike, too, and those are also doing quite well. So. And PFAS. Well, PFAS. Um, they currently, the UW Sea Grant is, is it the Aquatic Sciences Center? Sea Grant, okay, same thing. <laughs> uh, is funding some research. There, uh, it's just starting. It's, uh, um, and they're going to be doing PFAS uh, research up in the Menominee River area, in that in that area, and that that is going to be starting soon. And they're going to look at the fate of PFAS into the river and to, into the Bay of Green Bay. And you can find more information about that on the Wisconsin Sea Grant uh, website. How much um, is the effect of a wind coming rarely out of the north and driving water somewhere or whatever from Azor County and so it's just now towards the bay? It's 120 mile reach. Does that Are, happen very often or does the wind not out of the north very much? Uh, the question is so are you interested in like how water levels fluctuate or the or the actual sediment from Dora County? Well, say you got something coming out of the Menominee River, how likely is that to make its way towards the southern end, towards Green Bay, Wisconsin, southern end of the bay? How much mixing occurs, basically? Yeah. Not very, not very much that direction. We are, we are like the largest source of sediment and phosphorus to Lake Michigan. Um, and what happens is, let's see, if you. If you look at the topography of the bay, uh, the lower bay, I know this is sideways, but oops. Basically, it comes out of the river. There's a, it's such a strong current and stuff, it comes out of the river, and a lot of the, the water goes to the, what is that, the, uh, the east, and then it kind of goes up, and you see a long tail point up on the, the upper corner there, and then you have Point Sobel. And these two like landforms that they look like landform they're landforms here but they also like are sandbars that really extend in the bay so the lower green bay area is extremely sheltered so you have all this stuff coming out of the river in the bay and it kind of swirls around that area and then eventually some of it makes its way uh, towards Lake Michigan and then you have some more mixing of the cold water from Lake Michigan more in the northern area of the bay and sloshing around up there um, so the, their impact from the Menominee would be quite small um, comparatively to the impact of the, bay, uh, the river, Fox River. So that storm that you mentioned in 1976? Was that? That was a, nor northern, a northern storm coming from the north. Yes, okay, we, we have south. very strong uh, northern nor'easter storms that come down, barreling down from the northern part and push all the water to the bottom of the bay. That is true. And then that sloshes back the other direction, too. Yes? You did, you showed the slide of uh, no-till versus conventional till. Did they have in that same experiment, or in that same protocol in a different experiment, no-till, conventional till, 
constant cover crop? The question is, in the no-till, the no-till versus the tilled field experiment, did they also in, are they showing results for cover crop? The answer is, what they're doing in, for the demonstration farms for monitoring, it's, uh, they really need to do paired experiments of specific practices alone. So, <coughs> so in that one, my guess is it was just at this point, no-till versus till. However, there are fields that are doing um, traditional methods versus cover crops individually too. So that would just be a different paired field and experiments, yes. Um, and you could probably go to their website, the Fox demonstration, Fox demo farms, um, and find out more about the, the, exper the actual, what, how they're doing the monitoring. Yes. So I understand the whitefish are now uh, feeding on quagga mussels. Quagga, yes, quagga, quagga mussels. Um, and so have you seen a reduction in the quagga mussels as a result of the whitefish feeding on them? No. 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 <laughs> so um, most people are familiar with zebra mussels. Zebra mussels came in uh, to the Great Lakes in 1990s, uh, but they were actually quickly out competed by the quagga mussels. Quagga mussels are a little bit smaller, but they can. They're more efficient fi filter feeders, and they can attach to soft bottom. So quag zebra mussels can only really att they attach mostly to hard bottom surfaces like rocks and stuff. But quaggas can um, they can attach to softer bottom, so they can go several. They can ex uh, they can inhabit parts of the lakes. So um, zebras were only in like the rocky area areas. Quaggas are all over the Great Lakes at this point, and really in quite high densities. Uh, they've completely changed the food web and the ecosystem. I encourage you to reach out to the, the person at Seagret who focuses on the food web of, <laughs> of Lake Michigan <laughs> and the Great Lakes for, that, for more information about that. But um, there's also, we have round gobies too. Th things are starting to, things do eat the round gobies. They're kind of easy pickings. Uh, but the round gobies are like eating all the eggs, like perch eggs and stuff like that too. So it's kind of a... Is there local ordinances to limit the amount of lawn fertilizer people can put down? From my understanding, the state of Wisconsin passed no phosphorus in fertilizer. Is that correct? I don't remember. I, I, I don't know when that was. But uh, so that is, so that's just, that there, I mean, you don't go to like Home Depot or anything now and buy fertilizer with phosphorus in it. Other than that, um, I do not know, I've never heard of a local ordinance that, um, that, uh, requires or minimizes lawn fertilizer. No. Where's Cat Island? Um, I guess I can use this now that we're not on the, uh, so th that would have been this. And where's that new dredging? That's, it's in the same it's spot. In it's in the same spot. So uh, Cat Island, uh, they built this giant two and a half mile barrier and it comes out from the west side and goes two and a half miles just to the shipping channel, basically. Um, and so if you're ever up in that area and you're driving over the Leo Frigo Bridge, uh, you can actually see it quite clearly. <coughs> and the other island by Bay Beach is artificial, that's sediment? That's Bernard Island. So that was in the, that was, I think that was in the 70s, and that was, that's contaminated PCB fill um, that they put there, and it's capped. Um, and completely capped, and now they are actually just, re they just finished this year a Renard Island um, uh, public use plan for it. And so they are gonna provide access to it and kind of create like um, Summer Grounds Fest uh, in Milwaukee is similar. It was also a confined disposal facility that was changed into like a place to ride your bike and, and stuff like that. And so they're, they're, ta they're talking about the plans to do that with Renard Island even maybe doing a zip line from Renard Island to Bay Beach. <laughs> so they're, they're, they have the plan this year. They're shopping it out to see if anyone wants to do it. So that could be coming down the future, which is really cool too, because that will open up a huge amount of bay access. Any other questions? If not, thank you for your 